Felipe. It's 3.08, so we can get started. Uh, before we get started with today's lesson, we'll just do a quick recap, much shorter than last time's recap, about what we learned uh, last, last session. So, in an FRC application, what would a typical wheel on a shaft assembly look like? What would be the components and kind of in what order would they go? So, if you want to have a wheel mounted on a shaft and you want to be able to spin that wheel, how, what, because there's not only one right answer. So what's one way you could uh, spin that wheel? Let's say it's for the drivetrain. How could you spin a drivetrain wheel? What uh, what would you have to have mounted to the shaft or on the shaft or have the shaft on so you could have it at work? So you can put your answers in the chat or you can turn on your mic and just speak. I glitched out, okay, sure. Uh, so what would, so if you have a wheel, you're trying to spin a wheel on a shaft or an axle, whatever you want to call it, what would you have to have on that axle or shaft? Uh, let's say it's part of a drivetrain, right? So it's, it's part of a drivetrain. What components would you have to have on that axle or shaft? A gear. Yep, that's the way to drive it. And then you would have another gear on your motor, right? Manjot. So you'd have one gear on the wheel, one gear on the motor. Yeah, that's one way to do it. What else would you need on the shaft? Or what's another way um, we can drive? Because again, as I mentioned, there's not one right answer. So what's another way we could do it? Or what else do we have to add on this shaft? OK, so right now we have a gear attached to a wheel. How does the wheel connect to the shaft? What shaft is it, first of all? Let's start with that. What shaft is it? What kind of shaft is it? Is it just a cylindrical rod? Is it a cylindrical rod with a flat thing at the top? Hex? Yeah, I like that answer. So if it's a hex shaft, then how can we connect the wheel to the hex shaft such that when the shaft rotates, the wheel rotates with it? How can we do that? Is there anything we need to do specially? What kind of hub does the wheel need to have? Well, if the wheel has a hex hub, then it'll spin when the shaft spins as well. But how can we stop the wheel from going back and forth along the shaft. What do we need to add for that? Clamps, yep. Yeah. Well, yeah, hubs. I'll call them hubs, but they, they work, they clamp onto the shaft. So I get the idea, absolutely. Um, and then we're missing one more really important thing. So how are we gonna attach the shaft to the chassis, right? The, the sheet metal chassis, how are we gonna attach that spinning shaft? How are we gonna connect something that moves to something that doesn't move, which is the two sides the sheet metal chassis, that's your structure. How do we connect the shaft that's gonna be rotating to that to minimize friction? Ball bearings, exactly. <sighs> yes, I did, yeah. That's one component of the uh, of the system. So that's what we talked about. We talked about the hubs. Oh, wow, like a overlays already. Well, okay. So you can see the hubs are there, uh, the shaft collar, the bearings, uh, and that's basically what we talked about. So you would have your wheel in the center, your two shaft collars on either side, which is going to prevent it from going along the shaft, and then your bearings at the end of that shaft to connect it to your channel or your structure. Okay, moving on. What is the difference between a live and dead axle? <laughs> you don't have to be sorry to do it. It was, it was funny, but yeah. Ball bearings, not balls of steel. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so differences, what's it, does anyone remember what the difference between a live and dead axle is? Live is connected to power. Okay. Live axle is to which electricity is provided. Uh, not really. You're not going to put volts into your axle. It's not going to do much. If that's what you meant. If it's not, then I apologize. Dead, I believe, is only connected to the wheels. What do you mean it's only connected to the wheels? Because it, it both, okay, so both live and dead have to connect to the chassis somehow because the wheel can't just be floating. Uh, live axles are powered while dead axle is just there for support. Yeah, perfect. I think Shifam got the closest there. Um, okay, so Shifam, if, if the live axles are powered, so if a dead axle is just there for support, then how can we spin the wheel? If a live axle is powered, so you spin the axle, which spins the wheel, because the wheel is on the axle. That's a live axle. 
but a dead axle is only there for support, which means you don't spin it, then how can we get the wheel spinning? If we're not connecting to the axle, then what do we need to connect to directly? I think someone said it before, that we're attaching a, a gear directly to the wheel, which means that you're no, you don't spin the shaft, and then that indirectly spins the wheel, you directly spin the wheel. So an example is over here. Wow, they over, I didn't know it would do that. It's unfortunate, but okay, let's just hop out of this because I think it's the last question, so. That's okay. Um, so that way you can see that underneath it. So you can let's see that's just a screw right over there. It can just be a screw, and a screw obviously you can't spin a screw with the motor. Like you're not going to be spinning a screw; you're going to be spinning an axle. You can have live axles at the front that'll move the dead axles and pulling forward. Live. Oh, okay. There's a lot of stuff being said. Hold up. Uh, live axles are powered. Or you can have live axles at the front that will move the dead axles when pulling forward. So you're saying like you don't have all the wheels spinning. Some of the wheels are just spinning, free spinning. No. So we actually typically have all the wheels spinning. So all the wheels are actively powered. But the difference is, okay, so all the wheels actually spin. It's not like some of them are just there um, just to, you know, support it like you might see in some cars like not all wheels actually spin they just spin because they're getting pulled no in this all wheels spin but the way in which they spin is different because with this okay so you can see a couple different robots here right so if you look at the center one where it's ever, all the wheels are live those purple dots are chain and you can notice where they're connecting to they're connecting to the shaft right which is on the inside of the robot on the inside of the frame so when it's so it, when it connects to that shaft and spins the shaft, since the wheel is connected to the shaft, it spins the wheel also. If you look at um, dead wheels, now you look at the front, you can see that those purple lines are no longer connecting to the shaft. They're actually now touching the wheels, which means that that sprocket or that belt is directly connected to the wheel. So the wheel actually free spins on the shaft or free spins on the axle. And your gear or your sprocket in this case is connected directly to the wheel. That's the distinction. Are there any questions about that? It's not that those wheels are not powered. In both live and dead axles, the wheels will spin. Like not just spin because they're being dragged, but like actively spin. So in both cases, that's the scenario. But is the distinction between live and dead axles clear or do you need some more clarification? All good. Okay, perfect. Uh, all right. Front wheel. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um. Okay. Moving on. So, this. So we talked a lot yesterday. Basically, the brunt of what we not yesterday. Sorry, last class. What we talked about was wheels. We listen. We talked about a bunch of different wheels and what they can do and what they're used for. So let's start naming some wheels and what what what's unique about them or like what they can do. What's their properties? So let's just start naming some wheels. Mechanum, yep, that's one. Let me see how many I can think of. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's try to get six. Okay. So six wheels. Oops, I can't spell. Wheels. We have one out of six so far. Uh, and Shifam, what are what's special about mechanism wheels? Omni, yep, that's two, two out of six for Shifam. Shifam, sorry. So what's special about mechanism and Omni wheels? You can turn your mic on, by the way. It's much more engaging if you'd like to. It's easier to have a back and forth conversation if you just turn your mic on. Um, but if you don't feel comfortable, that's okay also. Compliant wheels, yep, that's correct option, three out of six. Standard wheels, sure. Call it that, four out of six. Ball wheels, what do you mean by ball wheels or fixed wheels? What do you mean by that, Rajan? Ones that don't have any rollers, they're just wheels. Yeah, also, are you talking about what you said or what Rajan said? 
you're talking about standard wheels, then I know what you're talking about. I would just call them, yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, standard wheels, yeah, traction wheels, standard wheels, same thing. Uh, I would call them traction wheels, but standard works as well because they're kind of the standard. Uh, fixed wheels are like standard wheels, same term. Oh, okay, sure. Uh, so mechanism has several segments with the wheel that are angled at 45 degrees, and I believe you told us last class how the physics of this wheel works, if I remember correctly. Yes, perfect. Did you say, okay, so what's omnis then? Uh, so you said mechanisms are 45 degrees. Omnis are sort of similar to mechanism, but those rotating segments are vertical and allow turning side to side. It's similar to, yeah, okay. It's, yeah, yeah, it helps turning. It helps with turning because it's able to skid more easily. We'll get a little bit more into that today. Uh, it's similar to mechanism, but the difference is that mechanisms are 45 degrees, whereas omnis are at 90. Uh, and Robin said ball wheels are like spherical metal nylon balls or any spherical spherical metal these days, material these days positioned within. Oh, like caster wheels. Okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, those are actually kind of wheels. So you would never see them used in FRC because they're not possible to power, or like, or at least very, very hard. You can't power them, right? They're just passively there. Um, so you typically don't see those used uh, in, in FRC, especially, you don't, you, you'll never see them on a drivetrain. You might see them in some type of uh, mechanism, but not in a drivetrain. That's absolutely fine. That's, that's actually correct. It's like a bonus. You know what? Oh, shoot, I forgot I was, I didn't count. I wasn't counting, but I think we have seven out of six because Rajan gave us an extra one. So there we go. We broke the chart. That's, no, there's nothing to be sorry about. That's perfect. We went over and above what we aimed for. Okay. Uh, so so anyone interested in seeing what a caster wheel is, what Roger is talking about, you'll probably know it. You probably don't. It's probably not coming to mind. Uh, I can pull it up really quickly. Yeah. But yeah, on on shopping carts, yeah. Uh oh, you were talking about oh okay, okay. The ones where it's just a ball inside a folder, yeah, okay. Yeah, those are the ones as well too. Yep. But yeah, seven out of six. The other ones the ones on shopping carts are basically just normal wheels and they're connected to like a turntable or a bearing or something. So they're able to rotate um that way. Okay, let's reveal the wheels. So the one on the left, that's a traction wheel. Uh Austin called it a standard wheel because it's it's pretty standard. It's what you normally use. Uh, it's what a lot of teams use. It comes in the kit of parts, which means it's the default drivetrain. Uh, but you can call it a traction wheel because it has a lot of traction. Uh, the ones in the middle are the mechanical wheels. You can see that the angles, or our rollers are angled at 45 degrees. And then the one on the left, I mean on the right, sorry, is the omni wheel. You can see that uh, the, ang the rollers are angled 90 degrees. So, and then the one, the thing at the top is just, um, that's, tread so that means you get a flywheel with just a metal flywheel with no nothing on the outside and you're able to attach your own custom thread again that's typically not done um, and it would definitely require a lot of prototyping to see like what finish works well like for a mechanism like an intake and um, for a drive frame you might be able to find some standard ones but for mechanisms you definitely do a lot of prototyping uh okay that's no problem edward um you can go if you need to uh and hopefully this will be recording this time so you can watch that Okay, oh yeah, and compliant wheels, and those two. All right, moving on. So over the course of the next couple of classes, uh, now that we've covered, covered the basics of mechanical concepts, we're actually going to be getting into specific subsystems, like drivetrains, intakes, shooters, and lifts. So in the first, in, the, in today's class, we'll basically be just going over drivetrains. So we'll be going over the different types of drivetrains, um, and there's basically two major types. There's your drivetrains that are holonomic, and your drivetrains that are not holonomic. What holonomic means is that, so if you take your hand, no, it's, uh, okay, so remember how we talked about mechanism wheels and how I said I might have mentioned they're able to do something called strafe? That's behavior of a holonomic drive. So what that means is holonomic drives can go forward and backward like all of the drivetrains. They can also turn like all of the drivetrains. So that's what your car can do, right? Think of the standard one or the traction tank drive as what your car can do. It can go forwards and backwards, and it can turn. Holonomic drives can additionally go sideways, side to side. So you got forward and backward. Let's say that's the y-axis, and you got turning. That's no axis really. And then you have your uh, you have your strafing, which is the x-axis. So that, and then of course the combination of that, so it can actually strafe diagonally um, at any angle. 
So that's what a Hall and Armored Drive Train is. Uh, so yeah, those are the ones. Those are the, those are the ones we're going to be covering. Um, you probably you might have seen them labeled with different names, but the essence is the same. Um, and we'll be covering all of those today. One important thing is that drivetrains are actually really important that they be very reliable. So you don't, if you're not, if your drivetrain is not reliable, you can't do anything else. Wait, can you guys still hear me? Because I think my mic might have cut out. I'm good. Okay, perfect. All right. So yeah, so drivetrains must be really reliable. The reason is you can have like the best shooter and the best intake, but if you can't move, you're a sitting duck, literally. Like you can't do anything. You can't play the game. So your drivetrain needs to be really, really reliable. Like it can't get messed up. It cannot break. Because like even if every other mechanism on your robot breaks, if your drivetrain at least works, you can still at the very minimum play defense. Sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. If anyone was there last year, you know that at least we had a drivetrain that worked. Why did we have a drivetrain that worked? Because we didn't design it ourselves and we used the kit of parts drivetrain. So that's why that worked. <laughs> Well, it worked when our electrical system decided to work. But mechanically, it never broke. And it was sound mechanically, from a mechanical aspect. What the programmers do, <clears throat> Virage, is not really our concern. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that was a very stable drivetrain. So you can make, a, you can have a crazy design for a drivetrain. But if at the end of the day, if it's not reliable, it's not good. Because your drivetrain has to be the most reliable part of your robot. Even with no, nothing else on your robot, as, we, as I mentioned, you can play defense like we did last year. Okay, moving on. So, the most common type of drivetrain you see in FRC, and typically other competitions is not that common, but for FRC, it's very common, and it's even the kit of parts drivetrain, is you have three wheels on each side, so that makes a total of six wheels, and they're typically all traction wheels. So that's your kit of parts chassis. Do I have them in the next slide? No, I don't. Okay, but that's your kit of parts chassis. It uses that white traction wheel we talked about earlier. Uh, Austin called it. The standard wheel, I think, something like that. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a grippy wheel. It's not, so it doesn't have any rollers on it. It's just rubber, um, and it has really good traction. And you have three per side. Now, the interesting thing that you might not notice initially, if you just take a look at the robot, is that your center wheel is actually lower than your back two wheels. So, and the reason that is, the reason your center wheel is lower than your front or back wheels, is because you, um, if you have three wheels all touching the ground you're going to have way too much traction when trying to turn, which means it's going to skid really badly or, or scrub, which means that it's not going to turn very well and it puts a lot of stress on your drivetrain um, and motors. So definitely not good. It, it makes turning very bad if you can turn it all. Um, so def that's why you have that central wheel lowered, which means that at any given point, only two wheels are going to be in contact with the ground, right? So it's either going to rock forward and the center and front wheel are going to be in contact with the ground, or it's going to rock backward, and your center and back wheel will be in contact with the ground. And now this difference doesn't have to be a lot. It can be, it's, it's actually very small, uh, but yeah, it's so that you, it's so that it makes turning easier. And let me just look at the comments real quick. So this is like the big cards at Home Depot to carry massive furniture. Uh, I'm not sure about the big cards at Home Depot. I've only seen the normal shopping carts, so I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Uh, but if you send a picture, then I can click it, and then I'll let you know. Um, okay. And the alternative to that is instead of using, uh, yeah. Did you have a question, Roger? No. Okay. Uh. Okay. Yeah. So instead of um. Instead of using the center drop uh, wheel that's dropped lower than all the others, you can actually instead just use um, omni wheels on the two ends. And the reason is because those omni wheels are going to have significantly less uh, traction. And in fact, when turning, if you recall, omni wheels uh, have nine rollers that are mounted 90 degrees, right? So when you turn, those rollers just skip and you basically get no scrubbing either. So that makes turning very easy, and that way you can have all the wheels at the same level if you're back and front wheels or omni wheels. Uh, which, the advantage of this is that you get a le lot less rocking, right? Because if, if you think about it, if you're driving forward, okay, you're on your front and middle wheel, right? But now you hit backwards, you quickly accelerate backwards, you're going to tip from your front and center to your back and center, which is going to cause this rocking motion on your robot. 
just a little bit, but especially if your robot's a high robot, that can be a problem. So with the Omni wheel, since they're all at the same level, that's not an issue. However, what you lose is you lose the traction. So now you have two wheels being Omni wheels. Uh, you don't get the same traction that you did before with the three wheel drop center. So that's why you have this kind of, um, you know, why you require at least one wheel to be drop center or you require uh, Omni wheels. So the, it, it enables you to turn. Uh, another thing is that um, there's other ways to do this as well. So if you actually use different threads on your wheels, you might be able to have them all in the same level, uh, but then your outer treads are more smooth compared to your inner tread. So it's relatively able to skid better. So that's this is not that common. Uh, it's Again, you have to do a lot of experimentation to see if this works out for your robot. So it's not something that I can tell you would work, um, but it's something that could work because in principle, it, it'll, it'll, if you use a smooth thread, it's going to be, uh, it's going to kind of be like a middle ground between using Omni wheels and all traction wheels. So you'll get a little bit more traction, but your turning won't be as good. Uh, but you'll still get that stability. You won't be, you won't be rocking back and forth. So there's other, uh, there's other ways to do that as well. Okay, so yeah, four wheel tanks are pretty rare. Like you don't see these in FRC. Uh, nearly as much as you see in other small robotics competitions. Um, yeah, four-wheel tank drives really not that common. Um, and it's just, you don't get a lot of traction, you don't get a lot of stability. Uh, it's really not the best. Uh, but essentially, you just use two traction wheels in the back and then two Omni wheels in the front. Um, you can even see that the image on the screen is not even an FRC robot, actually. It's pretty small. Um, that, like, motor... Actually, like, honestly, that entire robot could probably be the size of, like, a quarter of the drivetrain on an FRC robot. So yeah, you typically don't see that in FRC a lot at all. You also have your eight wheel double drop center. Um, it's like, it's it's cool, I guess, but you don't really get much more performance out of it. And it's a lot harder to build because it's now you're making something custom. Whenever if you use a custom, it's always worse. So if you can get away with doing something with pre-built parts, it's typically gonna be a lot easier, save you a lot more time. So. An eight-wheel drop center, you don't really get much more out of it. It's not that much better compared to a six-wheel. Uh, obviously, you get a little bit more traction, but it's on it. It's not not significant, and it is definitely a lot harder to build. Um, and in this case, you have your two wheels in the center that are dropped down, and the two wheels on the outer sides on each side are up. So that's how that one works. Similar principle. The reason the reason they're drops the exact same reason as the six-wheel drop center, so, so I can turn. Um, and again, it doesn't give you much more, you know, it doesn't give you much more ability to, or, or traction, it's slightly more, but it's definitely a lot harder to build. So typically not worth it. Oh yeah, and there's no support on the other side, which is, remember what we said about cantilevers, that's typically bad. Of course, this is a lot closer, like it's, they've tried minimizing the distance as much as possible. Um, so that's not really, it doesn't, it, it might not be an issue, might is the key word there. If you hit an obstacle, you drop the robot. Um, that might certainly cause you some issues. Yeah, but, but typically this this style of drivetrain actually is pretty popular. Although it's going to give like any industry engineer a heart attack because you haven't supported your axle from the other side. Uh, with games that there's not too many obstacles in the field, you might be able to get away with it. Um, but again, this is custom anyway, so there's not much more benefit in doing so. So I think Rotten sent a picture. Oh, those? Yeah, oh, I'd actually never, is, I never noticed that. Is the center wheels that are larger, are they lower down? Are they lower than the back and front wheels? Okay, yeah, then, then, that's, yeah, it's a good example, good connection then, for sure. Yeah, perfect, yeah, so then that way as well, yeah, so that way it, it probably helps you when you're turning. Um, and, well, it certainly does so in FRC, and I imagine it's for the same reason there. Uh, and moving on, so I think Kevin, you just joined. Um, I think it's Kevin. I'm not really sure though. Uh, Kevin, you just joined. So this video is, yeah, no, no worries, no worries. So this is being recorded. Uh, so you can watch it on the YouTube channel. You, you can continue following along for now. But uh, we're just talking about different types of drive trains. So again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in the chat. Even if you think you've missed something, that's all right. All right. 
So moving on to mechanism drivetrains. So we talked about mechanism wheels quite heavily. So we now know how they work. Uh, but now this is just how they're assembled in a drivetrain, kind of how you expect them to be after we talked so much about them last class. Um, so these these wheels, you have four of them. Uh, they're, top, they're typically either, they're all typically live driven and you have the motors either in the center like they are right now and then use belt to connect each of the wheels or the, uh, the motors are directly connected to the wheels. Either way, um, it's pretty simple. Well, it's not pretty simple because we talked about, it's simple now because we talked about the mechanics of it in last class. So you should understand how they work. Uh, but this is now a holonomic drivetrain. So all the drivetrains we mentioned over here, none of these are holonomic, which means none of them can move side to side. Okay, so we talk about X and Y. So all of them can move in the Y, they can all turn, but none of them until now could move in the X plane. This one can move in the X plane, which means it can strafe thus making it a holonomic drivetrain. And we talked extensively about how that works uh, in terms of how mechanism wheel vectors work and how vectors you can cancel and add in either the X or, uh, X or Y directions or even a combination of those two things to give you uh, your motion. And that means that you can also combine that, of course, which means you don't have to die only go in X or only go in Y. You can, again, as I mentioned, strafe diagonally uh, at any angle. So a lot more maneuverability. Downside is if you have like a lot of weight on if your center of gravity is not in in the center of your robot, uh, it's not in the center of your drivetrain of all the mechanism wheels, then you're you're not going to strafe straight. Which means when you try strafing, you're going to robot going to turn, which is really really annoying. It might be possible to compensate for with it in software, but anytime the build team goes, hey programmers, this is not working properly, can you try fixing it? It's never a good day. Uh, typically, you want your your mechanical to be sturdy, and hopefully, it doesn't have to be fixed by programming. And it might not even be possible to do so. And it's never going to be as good as if it was actually mechanically sound. So your center of gravity has to be very uh, good with these robots. It has to be in the center. If it's if there's a lot of weight on one side, like let's say there's a lot of weight on the back where your battery and your, uh, your shooter motors and your lift motors are, and there's basically nothing in the front because all you have is your intake and you left it hollow, they're going to intake balls or something, then you're going to have a problem because your back wheels are going to have a lot more weight on them which means they're gonna have a lot better connection of the ground compared to your front wheels. So you're gonna tilt, you're gonna drift instead of strafe. And when robots drift, that's not cool. It's cool when cars do it, not cool when robots do it. Um, because that drifting is not what you need. Of course, you can actually also drift. Like if, if you had your thing properly done, you could turn while strafing, which would be drifting. Uh, but when you drift and you don't want to, that's not good. Okay, so now you have an X drive. So X drive, and the way that works is you use omni wheels now instead of mechanism wheels, but you mount the omni wheels at a 45 degree angle. So typically you have all your wheels mounted at 90 degree angles, but with an X drive, you have your wheels mounted at 45 degree angles. Now you'll notice that it looks sort of familiar. So we said that omni wheels have um, rollers mounted at 90 degrees, and when you mount them flat, like 90 degrees, um, one right behind the other one. That, that applies. But if you mount the Omni wheels at a 45 degree angle, you're basically emulating the behavior of mechanism wheels. And the exact same things we talked about in terms of vectors for mechanism wheels apply to X drives. So mechanism wheels, you have the wheels straight and your rollers at 45 degrees, whereas an X drive, you actually take your entire wheel assembly and put it 45 degrees while your rollers are perpendicular, so 90 degrees. Okay, so X drive and mechanism drive use the same fundamental properties of how to achieve holonomic motion. Um, again, and that's what those vectors we talked about. Uh, and if anyone wants to have a review about how those vectors work, we can painfully go through MS Paint and have my whole laptop crash once again, and uh, we can do that. Okay, so moving on. Now, this is the Omni Wheel uh, drive that has five or six motors. Uh, that's because you're going to have all your Omni wheels like normally, uh, with that like you would normally mount a four wheel tank, but then you also have a wheel in the center that's perpendicular to all other all those other four wheels. So you'll notice that those that you have four wheels that are pointing um, straight, let's call it, from our perspective, and then you have one wheel that's pointing sideways, and that's ninety degrees, or it's perpendicular to all other four wheels. Now this is actually the simplest one to understand because you don't need to think of many vectors here. It's it makes sense. Because if you have, okay, if you want to go forward, what do you do? You just spin all the wheels, all the four wheels, not the center one, forward. Backward, same thing. You want to turn, 
It's the same way you turn a tank drive. You spin one side of the wheels backwards, one side forwards, you turn to that side. Now you want to strafe. When it comes to strafing, now you get your center wheel involved. So when that center wheel spins in whatever direction it spins, it's going to be exerting a force in that direction. And since your omni wheels, on all those four omni wheels, the normal ones, since they have rollers at 90 degrees, they're going to be able to strafe. They're going to, because they're have the robot has okay, let's for a second. Let's say we remove this the center wheel. You would be able to push this robot very easily sideways because it has no traction. It has free spinning rollers that allow, remember, the omni wheels have 90 degree rollers. So you would be very able to easily push this robot sideways. So now what you do is you add another wheel, which is perpendicular, facing that direction. So when you spin that, now you have the mechanism to actually move sideways. And when you're going forward like normal, now that center wheel, now its perpendicular rollers are spinning when you're moving back and forth with all the other four normal wheels. So that's how that robot is able to achieve holonomic movement. Disadvantage is you need five or six motors, which means you're taking a lot more power. You're just using a lot more motors in general, more weight. So you're generally just bad. The more motors you use, you don't want to do that. Um, but again, you could get you could probably get away with one motor in the center. Uh, but you still it takes up a lot more space because now you have to have an additional wheel in the center. Uh, benefits include being very easy to understand um, in terms of how it works, being very easy, even easier to program. Uh, but and it's not as uh, susceptible to weight distribution error. So it'll still strafe straight even when when you have your weight di distribution off. So it's a lot more forgiving in that department. Are there any questions so far before I move on to the real crazy stuff? So, okay, actually, because that's okay if you, if you're, completely not getting it. So does everyone, oh, let's, let's go one by one. Does everyone understand how mechanism wheels work? Including people that miss class because it's important that everyone's on the same page. Yes, people, we get how we understand how we remember how the vectors work from last time. It's not magic, like, wow, how can we spin these wheels in certain patterns and somehow we're now we're moving sideways? That makes sense? I think Aditya said yes, Rajan said yes, Shivam said yes. Okay, what about everyone else? Austin, you good? Kevin? Zorin? Dhruv? Manjot? Because there's no point sort of moving on past this point if you don't understand um, at least this, because it's just going to build on top of this and get more and more complex. So it's important that we have a fundamental understanding um, of these basic type of drive trains first. So I'll assume you understand how mechanisms work. Uh, again, X drive is literally just mechanism, but you're using omni wheels, and now you've mounted the wheels itself at 45 degrees instead of the rollers. That should be pretty simple. But does everyone understand now how this drivetrain works? What is this one called? Slide? Okay, sure. We can call it slide. Does everyone understand how the slide drivetrain works? I can call it, actually, I like H drive. H drive is better. Does everyone understand how the H drive works? Yes. 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 Okay, perfect. Awesome. Does anyone want me to go over uh, how mechanism wheel vectors work? Maybe we can do it at the end of class. Would anyone want me to do that? Because I noticed some more people are saying yes um, for this drivetrain compared to mechanism, which means hopefully that, you're, that they're not just sleeping and they actually maybe did not understand the mechanism wheel. So I've been lost in the yeses. There's too many yeses. Yeah, so let me just make a partition really quickly. So Below that, if you want me to cover uh, mechanism wheel vectors at the end of class. We won't go past four. We'll stay at four, but I'll allot some time at the end of class to do that. We're almost at the end of class, but so everyone's good with mechanism wheel vectors then? Okay, perfect. So moving on from here, we get to what everyone thought was coming. Swerve drive. Fortunately, I don't think Church is here to fangirl about the uh, 
Plus Drive. So I will give you a quick rundown. Swerve Drive is a drivetrain where you have four wheels and they're all they're all traction wheels. And yet it's a hall and on drive, which means you get full traction and full maneuverability. Like Turret likes to say, it's the king of drivetrains. You get the best of all worlds besides simplicity and reliability. But in terms of what I could do, best of all worlds. The the way, no, I should say the way, what it can do is that each wheel can spin. So you, you see four modules on the drivetrain. And in each module, uh, so each module has four wheels. Each module, the wheel can spin, of course, and, all, and it can only spin forwards and backwards. And it's a normal wheel. It's just a traction wheel. However, now imagine what your car can do, right? Because typically in all these drivetrains, the wheels don't move. They're rigidly mounted. Uh, and then if it's a holonomic drivetrain, you're able to have weird wheels like mechanism wheels or omni wheels mounted at different angles, and that's how you achieve that's how you achieve your strafing. Whereas in a car, if you think about how a car works, the wheels actually pivot, right? The front wheels at least they pivot to face and that's how you turn. In a swerve drive, it similar things it works similarly. Whereas in your car, I don't know how much they move, at what angle, maybe like 30 degrees, 45 degrees. In a sort of drive, they can go 360 degrees. So the wheels can continuously revolve and pivot to any angle. Each And each wheel can independently do so. So each wheel can independently go to any angle. Um, the entire module can rotate. So I think we have, uh, we'll come back to sort of drive. So that's not how sort of drives work. That's just what sort of drives can do. If we want, we actually get into how swerve drives work. So how many people would want to actually talk about how a swerve drive actually works? The, the reason I ask, and I'm not just telling you, is because it is highly unlikely that anyone will ever build a swerve drive here. It depends what grade you're in. You might. Depends. But we're definitely not going to build one next year. Let's just put it that way. Maybe as an off-season project for fun, but def certainly not during the build season, during actual competition. Would anyone like to actually talk about how a swerve drive works? Because that's, this has just been what a swerve drive can do. Each module rotates independently, so the wheel can face any angle, and that wheel is, of course, able to spin forward and backwards like any normal traction wheel. That's what it can do. Is there anyone that wants to know how it can do that? You can just put it in the chat or turn on your mic. No, we're all good. Can you say generally? How are they able to go forward and backward? Okay. Uh like very brief. Uh not well the brief is what they can do, right? That's that's the brief. The brief is what they're able to do. How it's able to do that uh is the tricky is the tricky part there, right? Um so, okay, let me, let me try to read it. How are they able to go forward and backward? Forward and backward is the simplest part, right? That's just any wheel, any traction wheel. Any traction wheel is able to go forward and backward. You just spin the motor either forwards or backwards. And then that's how it goes forwards and backwards. That's just any wheel can go forwards and backwards. How it, how it pivots while retaining its ability to go forwards and backwards is where it gets interesting. And yes, I did too. Each, each wheel does have two motors. One motor to, to actually spin it, like normally spin it, and one motor to turn it to any angle required. And typically the motor that turns it has an encoder on it. So all motors should have encoders, but that has a particularly good one. It has two motors, which means eight motors in a photo drive. Yep. Makes sense? Okay. Yeah, so that's that's what it can do. Uh, I, wow, I'm surprised. I thought Aditya was asking so much about the swerve drive that he would want to see it talked about. But guess not. That sounds like a waste of motors. It does take up a lot of motors, but I mean, it's a really good drivetrain. It's also really hard to build. If we talked about how it works, you'll see that. It's typically very hard to build, very hard to machine, but it's the king of maneuverability. You have ultimate pushing power and ultimate maneuverability. 
Gee, I'll, I don't know. I can show you a video uh, of an FRC storage drive. Let me just see if I can find one. This is probably going to crash. So, uh, that's an FTC one. That's an FTC one. Okay, let's try this one. This is only 53 seconds. So, it should be nice and quick. So it's able to do all of that. It's able to do all of that while retaining all of its pushing power compared to uh, with an actual drive train. So yeah, it's really cool, uh, but it's very hard to build. If we have time in other classes, wait, can you guys still hear me? I'm just concerned every time I switch screens and stuff that everything stops working. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. Uh, awesome. Um, also, they move forward thanks to gears located at the sides of the wheels. So, yeah, I mean, it's a lot more complicated than that, but yeah. Depends on the design, of course. Some do, some don't. Um, yes, yeah, so there's, there's, there's different ways to make sort of drives. Uh, if, if I want to show you in brief, if you just want to have the simplest understanding of how it works, we're almost running out of time. Do I have anything after this? I think I do. I think I have one slide. I just did that one side, and then if we have time, we'll come back to this. Or we can go to the and wheel back here, whatever you guys want. Why can I not switch the slides? Oh, because the entire page just crashed. Beautiful. Uh, one back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back. Wow. It really, really did a crash. Well, I might lose connection to this entire meeting, which would be very disappointing. Nope. I so some sort of connection. Let me just refresh this page while I still have the ability to do so. Give it a second. This is what happens when you have to screen record and screen share at the same time. Uh, okay. Well, now it's loading. Let me come back to the mute to see if that's anything. Did my Wi-Fi lag? No. It's probably just me that's lagging. Uh, okay. So the last drive train, once it comes up on screen, after this slide unloading, is uh it's very interesting to say the least so the last one is called octonome or some people call it butterfly by far bad drive trip okay because like it's just not good and it's really complex to make basically each wheel has both a traction wheel and a mechanism wheel mounted to it and using pneumatics you're able to switch which one is facing the ground so if you want traction, you can switch to traction. And if you want maneuverability, you switch to the mechanism wheels. And at that point, when you're building all of that, you might as well just build a sort of drive, which is going to be much better anyway, because while this one, you can only choose between having either traction or maneuverability. Again, a swerve, you can have both at the same time. And this is just ridiculously complex. It's almost as complex as a sort of drive. So at this point, if you're going to make this, you might as well just build a sort of drive. So overall, not a cool drivetrain. Cool mechanism. Interesting to see how it works. But not a good drivetrain. Not worth it, I should say. And uh, so now we're talking about, we've talked about all these different drivetrains. Which one do we use? I would say that it depends on the game, but what it, it does, which it does. But what it depends on even more is your what you are actually able to make and what you want to budget time to make. 
Because remember, the more time you spend making your drivetrain, that means less time for everything else on your robot. And yeah, the drivetrain is important, but you can't have a robot that doesn't shoot or doesn't intake. That's not going to work either. So, yeah. yeah, that thing is cursed, 100% cursed. Like, 1,000% cursed. Technically, Surf is like, Surf is the same level of complexity. But this thing is just dumb. Like, it's not even good. It's complex and bad. Like, that's just, that's not even, it's just, it's just bad. And, I mean, the advantage is it has one motor. But you still technically need one pneumatic for each, uh, for each wheel. So you still have two actuators. One is a motor and one is a pneumatic cylinder, but still requires two actuators per wheel. Uh, and yeah, this thing is just not good. Very cursed indeed. But yeah, so typically, and for the foreseeable future, we're going to be using the most boring kit of parts drive frame, which is all the way back here. This one. The drop center, not even the one of the Omnis, like the first one, the drop center with traction wheels. Why? Because it comes with the kit you buy in registration, because it's been proven and tested to work like a trillion times. It's reliable, and it's not a bad drive frame. It's not holonomic, which is, you know, you kind of lose on some maneuverability. But it's reliable and it works, which is the most important thing. And we don't spend any brain cells trying to make it. We don't spend any time trying to make it because there's instructions. Literally like Lego instructions how to make it. Whereas all these other drivetrains, you're likely going to have to design from hand or try to re-engineer. <laughs> oh, Viraj is back now. This is amazing. Do not believe in your ability to build a serve drive. Yeah. Well, they... I, forget that. They didn't want to learn how a serve drive works. I literally asked who wants to learn how a serve drive works, and nobody said yes. So how are you going to build it without even knowing how it works? See, it's not my fault anymore, Raj. Anyway, yeah, we're, we're probably going to be building the kit of parts drivetrain. Anything else? No, there isn't. Okay. Now, now, now in the last five minutes, we have a choice to make. Uh, would, I did, but I was scared to ask. Why are you scared to ask? Never be scared to ask a question. It's absolutely fine. We have classes upon classes. And if the thing is, if you have a question, I know everyone says this, but it's like true. If you have a question, someone else probably has like a similar question to that. So if you ask, you're not only helping yourself, you're helping someone else. So it's not like you're the only, it's, it's pretty unlikely that if you're confused about something, other people are probably confused. Okay, so we have five minutes. Uh, so in those five minutes, who would prefer to see how a serve drive works? Okay, no. Let's see how the beginnings of a serve drive work. Or to see how mechanism wheel vectors work. Which, by the way, we covered last class, but that's okay if you want to vote for it again. Make a vote, 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 vote in the comments. Or do you want to leave early? That's the most boring option, confirmed. Leaving early is definitely the most boring option. Swerve? Okay. That's one vote. I'm not, I, we don't have time for more votes, though, to be honest. So we're doing swerve. Okay, so this is, interestingly enough, a tech design project that Austin did. Austin, you recognize this project? You probably do. Okay, uh, swerve, swerve. That's two swerves. Sounds good. Sounds good. Sounds good. Okay, this is called a bad swerve. This swerve will not be used in FRC because scalability. So whereas you can, mine was kind of like a swerve drive. Yeah, that was the assignment. It was it was a swerve drive. Everyone was supposed to basically build it. Do I remember it? No, I don't. I don't really remember it. Unfortunately, uh. We can buy pre-built serve parts. I don't think it would be... No, 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 no. Stop, stop it, Raj. Don't no, Raj. That's an off-season thing. We have agreed. That is an off-season thing. That if he gets it working, then and only then, in off-season, will we even touch it during build season. Anyway, this, since we only have three minutes left, is the bad version of a serve drive. The good version is below, but, like, that's too complicated for three minutes. I don't have time to go over that in three minutes, so I'll show you the bad version. The reason it's bad is because it doesn't scale up. You can't make this in FRC. You just can't. You can make it in things like VEX and FTC because your motors and wheels are smaller. Uh, but you can't do so in FRC because the reason is, I'll show you. I'll show you the the, the animation. You have you have a motor that's connected directly, but the simplest by far to understand. You have a motor connected to your wheel. So when that motor spins, your wheel spins. And then you have another motor that's connected. Okay, don't worry about the third motor. That's just a tech design thing. Don't worry about that. But the two motors, the two main ones, don't worry about this animation. That's absolutely useless. And you will never need to do this for a server. Oh my goodness. Slides. Cooperate, please. Okay. Yes. So 
the first motor, the first thing that spins the wheel, and then right, what's pivoting right now, that's what I mean when I was pivoting. So this is the bad way to do it. Uh, the reason it doesn't work is because the motor that's attached to the wheel is a lot bigger and a lot heavier in FRC. So at that point, it just becomes not conducive to actually spin an entire extra motor. So now the challenge becomes is how do you spin, the, how do you rotate the wheel while being able to spin it uh, while keeping both motors stationary?